welcome formally and and thank you very much lucy for um giving us this talk it's um it's wonderful uh that, that kings has an uh, official um archivist and a professional archivist and your your um uh, talented uh, amateur predecessors have i think left you with with uh, with good material to uh, to work with mm -hmm. uh, and we're all very excited uh, about this if you do want to pipe up i think we're going to keep it fairly loose and informal so um, if, if you have something to add about i think um, I'm, I'm guessing that lucy might work through in a slightly um, um, chronological order in terms of the age of the archive. If, in, in any case, if you if you if you spot yourself or um, or something uh, that you're familiar with, um, then pipe up. Um, L L Lucy uh, has, has agreed that that's okay. Um, otherwise, what we'll do is we'll have a question and answer at the end, and um, I'll be able to see if you raise your hand physically or digitally and i'll just call it call it call your names out and and um that'll be great um no 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 lucy okay great well i wanted to start just by thanking um alexander for organizing this event and to everybody for coming um i thought i should briefly um uh, just introduce myself I started working as a school archivist at King's in December 2018, initially two days a week, but moving to three days a week last August. Um, my background is in art history, but I retrained a few years ago and was awarded a postgraduate qualification in archives and records management from UCL in 2017. I do have a somewhat tenuous connection to the school, however. Um, I grew up in Wimbledon, I went to Wimbledon High, and my brother was at King's. I'm slightly nervous about talking to you tonight, not only as it is my first stab at presenting over Zoom, but because I know some of you will be more familiar with aspects of the school archive and certainly the school's history than I am. Over the years, several articles about the history of the school have appeared in OKC newsletters. The information for these was gleaned from the school archive. These articles started in 1985 when Frank Miles, head of English, but also the archivist at Kings, included features on selected old boys based on the extensive research which he had carried out when compiling the four volumes of registers of alumni. Brian Stokes, head of chemistry, took over the mantle of school archivist from Frank Miles, and he continued to share interesting snippets in the OKC newsletters under the heading from the archives. Before both Frank Miles and Brian Stokes, much loved teacher Dougie um, DL had performed the role of school archivist. All three men brought to this task a huge amount of knowledge about Kings. Each had taught at the school for well over 30 years. And if I'm correct, I added up their combined sort of teaching length of time is 110 years. They also carried out additional research into the history of the school, producing publications ranging from themed booklets up to the incredibly detailed book, which Frank Miles and Graham Cranch, OK and Governor, completed in 1979, which we see on the right. In comparison, I feel I have only scratched the surface of what there is to know about the history of Kings. There are many items in the archive which I have yet to even look at. Nevertheless, over the past couple of years, despite the disruption caused by the pandemic, I have really enjoyed exploring the archive collection and discovering what it contains. The archive collects material which documents the activities of the school from its foundation in 1829 to the present day. It includes things such as early admissions registers and entrance papers, school lists, correspondence, school magazines and newsletters, programmes for theatrical, musical and sporting events, prospectuses, photographs of staff, pupils and school buildings, press cuttings, uniforms and trophies, artworks and books written by former staff and pupils. The main functions of the archive are to manage and preserve these documents and artefacts, but also to make them available, both internally at the school, to members of the public and of course to alumni. The archive is a rich source of information providing evidence of past decisions and actions at King's. It can also at times shed light on wider social and cultural events and developments. But the archive is also a repository of memories. In my relatively short time working here, I have become aware just how many people 
like DL, Miles and Stokes, spent their entire working lives at King's, some having been a pupil there first. There are several instances of multiple generations from the same family all attending the school. And I show here photographs of the Price family, and I think there may be some members here tonight. Um, and the photograph on the right was very generously shared with me by Neil Price. So we see um, Henry Wallace Price, who was on the staff at King's from 1898 to his retirement in 1934. He was also secretary of the OKC, sitting there on his lap is his son, Hugh Price, who attended the school in the 1930s. And Hugh's, and Hugh's two sons with him, um, who were there at the school in the 1950s and 1960s. Family links were a feature of school life from its inception. Perhaps the most famous 19th century example is the artist Dante Gabriel Rossetti. His brother William also attended the school and their father taught Italian there. Rossetti is one of several early King's pupils who went on to distinguish themselves in their chosen field. Yet the information about such people in the school archive is limited. The majority of the records up until 1911, the date at which the school and the college officially separated, have remained at King's College. Nevertheless, there are some lovely examples of pupil artwork produced when the watercolorist John Sell Cotman was, Cotman was master of drawing. And in fact, the one on the upper right there was by, is by Rossetti. There are items relating to prize givings and holiday homework. There are bits and pieces of correspondence, a few photographs. There are the nomination and entrance registers from 1831 to 1908. As you can see from this photograph, they are incredibly fragile and we don't get them out too often. And there are also some school reports from the early years. Um, these end in 1868, but I thought I'd show just this one entry. It's, it's hard um, to see properly on the screen, but essentially each row is, um, relates either to, to a term or at least um, to a section of time throughout the school year. Um, this is one for somebody called Sydney Shepherd, who was at King's from 1849 to 1855. Um, but as you can see, or probably tell, um, compared to today's school reports, it's pretty to the point. The first entry reads, all that can be desired. The second, simply ditto. But as I say, in general, there tends to be very little in the way of information about specific individual pupils or indeed teachers, often to the dismay of those contacting me about family history or because they are researching someone who went on to be significant in one way or another. It is a trend which continues into the 20th century records. In fairness, it would be impossible to keep everything. Keeping around 5% of all the records created is about average for archives. And the documents in the King's archive are, as you would expect, generally about the activities of the school rather than individuals. Still, within this collecting remit, there are documents which shed some light on people as well as the institution. There are copies of pupil-led magazines, starting in 1889 with The Sneezer, through to publications such as The Oracle, which ran from 1970 to the early 1990s, past Indicative in the 1980s, and Graph more recently. There are some general photographs of pupils and teachers such as these. The vast majority of the photographs, however, are associated with specific aspects of school life. For instance, there are photographs of prefects. There are several photographs of sports teams, both the senior and the junior school. There are photographs of CCF, formerly OTC activities, including at camp and during inspections. And we have some of the winning Ashburton Shield teams from the 1930s. There are photographs of school trips, such as this one in 1939 to Wales. And there are photographs relating to school societies, such as the Film Society and to drama productions. Very often there are related print materials which can help to give a more rounded picture. So for example, here you can see the program for the Henry IV production as well as the photographs. 
There are various documents relating to sporting activities, such as fixture list, lists and programmes for sports days. And sometimes the print materials might be the only record we have, which is often the case with musical productions. A good example of where there can be multiple types of documents relating to a single activity is with the school's film society and associated film unit. For those of you who are not familiar with it, the film society was established in 1948 by the teacher Jack Smith. Um, and it started as a film appreciation group and it, was, it would show a mixture of kind of um, foreign films, but also current comedies, things like the Marx Brothers. Um, in the early 1950s, uh, a film unit was set up um, it devised, wrote, directed and edited a, a series of short films up until Jack Smith left King's in 1961 to work at Granada Television. And although a film unit did continue after this, it was had sort of slightly less focus to it. The work of the unit was very highly respected. It was mentioned in a, quite a few BBC programmes and one of the films was awarded an Oscar by Amateur Cineworld. And I'm showing here just a few of the records we have to demonstrate how they can complement one another. So there's the programme for the premiere of the film, The Wimbledon Hill Mob. On the left is a photograph of the film in production. And there's a newspaper article about the unit. Um, and I've included as well a write-up of the premiere of The Wimbledon Hill Mob, which appeared in the school magazine. The school magazines are, without doubt, the single most useful resource for providing information about school life. The first magazine appeared in 1873, only for its production to be abruptly stopped until the mid-1890s. But there is now pretty much a complete run of the magazines in the school archive, and they often help to contextualise other records. For example, Although there are letters from the headmaster Charles Bourne to the College Council about the proposed move of the school from the Strand to Wimbledon in the late 1890s, it is the school magazines which tell us about the move itself. And they describe what it's like, um, when it actually happened, um, what it's like being at the new school, suddenly having playing fields, which obviously was a big reason behind the move in the first place. If any of you know anything about the, uh, the history of the school when it was on the Strand, it had a very, very small outside area because they were down in the basement and uh, it was quite a long trek, I think, for them to get to use um, the playing fields, which they had somewhere across London. Between them, the magazines and the images in the archive reveal a lot about the physical evolution of the school site as well. When Kings first moved to Wimbledon in 1897, all there was was a big house with a big garden. And you can see here the photograph at the top, which shows the site before the Great Hall was built. And in the uh, bottom of the screen is the design which Bannister Fletcher, who was the professor of architecture at King's College, um, he proposed, he, he originally envisaged it would be not just the Great Hall, but a series of classrooms as well, so that it would look like a typical public school. A lack of money meant the scheme never came to fruition, only the Great Hall was built. A collection of what were supposed to be temporary structures were built instead, and the interiors of two of these you can see here. In 1913, the first of the permanent buildings appeared, the initial science block, which was added to later, most significantly in the 1950s, followed by the pavilion and the gymnasium. In 1929, a new block was built to celebrate the centenary of the school. And uh, I, so I understand, as I've been told, close to this is where the tuck shop was originally um, located. In 1967, a further building programme included the addition of more classrooms and a new dining hall. And the library moved into where the old dining hall had been. And you see here, so this is the new dining hall, which is still in use today. And what I discovered when actually putting these um, the slides together is that the mural you can see in the uh, in the dining room there was actually painted by pupils because in a completely different series of photographs um, we can see the pupils in the art room actually uh, finishing off the mural. And obviously there have been a lot of changes to the campus uh, since the 1980s, and I won't uh, I won't go through all of these, but again they are there documented in the photograph. Um, 
the sports facilities in particular moved on quite a long way from the open air swimming pool in the 1930s due to the original sports hall in the 80s and now the brand new one that opened in 2019. The changes to the junior school building are also recorded in the archive. Um, again, it was a house which was acquired by the school and then has been extensively kind of remodeled over the years to make it have the feel more of school with classrooms. And in some cases, there are plans for new buildings as well as photographs of the structure itself. And I show here the drawing for the small block of new classrooms which were added in the 1960s, which have now been demolished. As I mentioned at the beginning, the archive not only captures moments in the history of Kings, but also sheds light on bigger moments in history, most notably the two world wars. Um, so as you can imagine, or you may well know, um, an awful lot, um, is recorded in the school magazines about people, OKs, who fought in both wars, um, details of uh, where they were serving and sometimes um, letters that were written back, obituaries, etc. Um, but there are also a collection of the original letters which were written to the school or passed on to the school by family members, very sadly, most Often these tend to be about people who were killed in action, but nevertheless, they are a quite incredible and poignant um, primary resource for us to have. There are also photographs of air raid shelters and the bomb damage which was sustained at the school. And these combined again with commentaries in the school magazines and recollections added later for, from former pupils, provide insight into life in a London suburb during World War II. The small moments are also present in the archive. And this is um, a couple of pages from a letter written in 1866 by a member of the school staff to the principal of the college about the inadequate food on offer at lunchtime and recommendations for what they could do to change it. We have a menu card for the luncheon, which was held as part of the centenary celebration in 1929. And this is a programme for and a photograph of a May Fair, which was held in 1925 in order to raise money, essentially to pay off the debt that had been accrued by the school purchasing the West Barnes Lane playing field when it didn't really have the money to do so. And I think there's something incredibly touching about the fact that this was put on by teachers and parents and essentially it's sort of having a massive cake sale and that sort of thing. Um, to try and help with the school's finances. We also have objects. It's not all paper or two-dimensional um, material in the archive. So um, apologies for the terrible photographs. They are by their very nature slightly trickier to photograph, but there are items of uniform, even going back as far as 1880. We also have quite a lot of blazers and ties. And we have a couple of boaters, which, uh, the current pupils really enjoyed seeing when they were on display and a Batman wanted to try on. We have medals, we have trophies. We also have um, some items from the OT OTC, um, sort of part of uniforms. And we have the model engine that is the replica of the school's class locomotive. I don't know, again, if people are familiar with this, but in the 1930s, um, I forget now which railway it was, but they named a whole fleet of their engines after public schools and Kings was one of those. The number plate there is, I think, a replica, but we do still have, although it's in storage now, the Kings Wimbledon sign from the train. And if you're interested, if you go onto the BFI um, player website, you can actually see it's only about a minute long, but a clip of um, the pupils from the school going down to Wimbledon station and actually climbing all over this uh, the train with the school's name on it. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, there are books that are written by alumni, um, but also we have an almost complete set of the books produced by the Art Society Press in the 1950s and 60s um, under the stewardship of art master Robert Holloway. And I'm also including here one of the Christmas cards produced by the press. They also were responsible for designing and um, producing and printing an awful lot of the programme. So those the film unit programmes, one of which I showed earlier, 
that would have been designed and produced by the Art Society Press as well. There are artworks and showing a couple here. So this is an etching of the Great Hall. And we also recently had a donation of Cotman Prince, as I said, Cotman um, taught at the school. He started there in 1837. And these were kindly donated to the archive by uh, Tony Hine, who I'm sure you all know well. The archive also collects the records of the OKC. I don't know if we have all of them, that's something we don't, I'm not sure we don't have a, a formal agreement in place, but we have um, the rule books, we have the list of members, we have all the OKC newsletters, we have quite a lot of photographs of OKC dinners, which have been held over the years and programs for dinners as well. Um, in terms of other organizations connected to the school whose records you might expect to be held in the archive, and I'm thinking here mainly of the King's Lodge and the Friends of Kings, there is actually very little. And the Friends First Minute book, a page of which is seen here, is the only item I have found to date from them. These records, I've just mentioned, are not the only omissions. Having shown you what there is, and I could have selected plenty of other examples, I should admit that there is a lot missing. Other than the school magazines, every series of documents is somewhat patchy. For example, the school lists, and you see the covers here, um, they start, so these are the lists of pupils by, um, by form that were printed. Now they're only printed annually, once upon a time, it would be at least um, twice a year. So they start in 1880 and we have from 1880 to 1891, and then there's a break until 1916. Now, I don't know if we're simply missing those copies or if they just did not produce them during those years. Um, with other things, such as um, the photographs, I'm guessing it's because the school just simply didn't keep their own copies. When we think of things like the team photographs, the photographs of prefects, I would imagine it might be a bit like today where it would be you as a pupil could purchase a copy of that photograph, but the school didn't necessarily retain its own. So to be honest, the main reason we have so many, again, is because people have very kindly given us their copies and donated them to the archive. Um, we are especially lacking from the sort of 1960s onwards, especially the 1960s to the 1980s. I think from the 1980s onwards, the school obviously started to, um, to actually hold back some copies of their own ones, but there is definitely a lack there, as I say, between the 60s and the 80s. And in fact, in terms of photographs in general, more and more photos start appearing in the school magazine in the main one and in Cabbages and Kings, the junior school magazine. But I don't have the original photographs in the archive, so, and I don't know what happened to them. Um, there's a lot less kept about the junior school than the senior school. There is very little in the way of papers belonging to teachers or even headmasters. There is scant information about the curriculum and exam results. And actually very few of the school societies are fully documented. Um, you may also be wondering that I haven't really mentioned other than the friends much in the way of, of minutes and in fact those are the governing body and of the major school committees and even the senior common room are kept still um, by the bursa they're not um, in the school archive partly that's a safety thing um, they are kept very securely and I am hoping to at least get an inventory of what there is so that we know but they're not something that I manage within the archive. I wanted to finish off just by sort of running through quickly what the plans are for the future of the archive. Well, there's ongoing work around cataloging, repackaging in preservation, including the preservation of digital records, which will increasingly become an issue. Um, it always, I think, um, quite surprises mm. people when I say that um, it's actually hard. Sorry? Um, that it's harder to manage digital records often than it is physical records. Physical records, if you leave them somewhere, as long as there's not a flood, um, they will probably survive. Whereas uh, digital records are quite easily lost or you find the files being become corrupted. 
Um, uh, the cataloging is really because until that's done, it's quite hard for us to know what we've got. And ideally, we'll end up with cataloging software. So it will be very much easier um, to locate material when we need to find it. Um, sorry. Oh, and yes, and actually start putting procedures in place to make sure that the transfer of records um, from the school to the archive starts to happen um, so that we don't end up in a position where we are missing records in the way that we are at the moment. I would also like to add to the content of the existing archival material by recording some oral history interviews with alumni and former members of staff. And I see these as a continuation of previous recollections of school life, which have been collected at various points over the years, at times in the past. Um, people have been very good at coming forward with their reminiscences, either in a quite an informal way or actually writing them down. And those are all lodged in the archive. And I think, especially somewhere like King's, where so much of what we want to capture is actually about the experience of being at the school. And paper records, even if we kept everything, are not going to do that in the same way as somebody actually explaining what it was like to be there will. Um, and finally, I hope to start making some of this information and some of these stories from the archive available online. Um, it's something I've started and I plan to add to over time. If you go to the school website under useful information, you will find a page about um, the history of the school and the archive and if you click there there's a little thing that says find out more about the archive and then that takes you to a separate dedicated page where that content will be continually be um, refreshed and added to um, and in fact one of the things that I'm quite keen to do is some of the films that were made by the film unit have now been digitized. It will involve quite a lot of work to get into the stage where we could show them because they need to sort of be edited together. But I think it would be great to make these available online. Um, and until then, I hope this is gonna work. I thought I would just play a clip from a film that was made at Commemoration Day in 1953. Um, there is no sound. The majority of these films um, don't have sound. Um, which of course I realized was because at the time some of them just didn't. Um, they generally had a musical score um, and some of the earlier ones were composed by um, uh, John Carroll Case, who was the director of music and he would play live at every single screening of the films. So I think there was one commemoration day where they had about 10 screenings that they were all packed out and he had to sit in the great hall in the heat playing and playing and playing. Anyway, he did this. So this one has no sound, but hopefully um, people might recognize some bits and pieces of the score. If anyone would like to, as Alexander said, uh, chip in, feel free to, uh, to speak. Let's just hope that this will work. I think a bit, a bit of a free for all, just pipe up yeah. if, if you recognize anything. I think most of us here are a bit young for recognizing much. Well, it's odd because often when I look at these things and I go through as I have done here and it's about seeing sort of what's changed, especially because the school does look quite different in lots of ways. But then it also surprises me when I look at it and think how much of it stayed the same. You've just seen me in the front row with my parents. Just <laughs> Who said that? Clark Walters. Ah, very, very good. See, I think it's quite sad that they don't have commemoration day any longer. I remember going, I must have gone at least once when my brother was at the school and it was, I mean, mainly it was like the tea, I think, but it was still quite a nice day. And then we all piled across the road to the, uh, the billet in the hand. I found the commemoration. I think the commemoration, I agree, the commemoration day was um, a fantastic event. I remember being massively inspired by the jazz band that played when mm. I was um, developing as a musician and then in, encouraged me to start our own one. 
the live music was amazing. Yeah. I can believe it because, and it is a shame because I'm now, what days, it must be Friday afternoons when I'm at school and the jazz band now will be practicing and, and it spills out because they're in the, I'm quite close to the new music school and it's incredible. Um, I, I, um, I, this may be more specifically the jazz band of, of a, a smaller like a quartet of guys just on their own, making their own band up. Mm. Um, in, the independence of it came across on commemoration day mm. yeah I'm, I'm always grateful to kings for finding music i sang with the various choirs learned the trumpet since then i've been a music teacher a cathedral lay clerk and i play bass in a trad jazz band it gave me a lot thank you and was i was a member of, of the ridge wave stompers who's that which it's david buckley great Oh, 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 yeah, you were the guys that inspired you. You, the Ridgeway Stompers, inspired us. That we became the King Swingers, which David Buckley. Uh, yes, uh, I was the uh, keyboard, or rather, well, keyboards then were called piano. Uh, <laughs> I, I was uh, a member of the Ridgeway Stompers, which uh, through the late seventies was the jazz band of the school, really. Mm. <clears throat> I spotted a bit of fencing there. Paul Engram is here. Is easy. I'm sorry. Oh, fencing. Yes. 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 Uh, and, Matt, Mike. And the chap that was presiding was Mike Smith, who was still in charge of fencing when I when I was there. And and when I was there. Yes, Matt, Mike. Mm. He, he ran yes, six yes. form cycle tours at Easter. We visited all sorts of places on bikes with Mike Smith. I, I used to run them with him. In fact. Yes. Myself and two meteors. Right. Well, Do you know a fabulous, a, yep. a fabulous story about Mike Smith was that apart from his excellence in uh, fencing and physics, uh, he also started the archery club in the mid 1970s. Now there may have been one prior to that, but he was quite clever in using to suggest that boys should in fact uh, take up archery. He pointed out that in many of the, at that time, in, in many of the counties in Great Britain, uh, in England certainly, the law still existed that any man over the age of 12 who did not shoot a minimum of six arrows <clears throat> per day had a choice of punishment of either having his eyes put out or being gelded. It had quite an effect on a few people to at least try archery. I'm surprised it didn't have a very good effect on people. I think <laughs> if I'd chilling. known that that was a possibility. <laughs> Lucy, I was wondering if you could... Uh, Mike Smith, like, Mad Mike, was a lovely man. Could I, could I ask where the archive is? Is there a room full of all these bits of paper? So, um, most of it is actually kept um, in a basement, which normally would fill me with horror, but it's actually got very good um, conditions in there. The um, It's in the Cavan Taylor basement. So the temperature and the relative humidity down there remains constant pretty much throughout the year. And we've got rolling stacks. Um, so that's where most of it's kept. We have a few bits and pieces. We actually now have two rooms in the, if you know the old music school, which was built in the 1980s, in what were yes, the rehearsal yes. rooms that are no longer used. So there's a space now for us to just use as an office for, to be working on whilst we're cataloging material but also it means there's actually a dedicated room for people want to visit um that, that you know that you can come to and there's a table and you can sit down and go through things and hopefully there will come a time where people actually feel comfortable <laughs> going into spaces again and seeing people which would be nice um so you you very kindly offered um 
that I could uh, show a couple of, of large um, mm -hmm. artifacts and and so on that that are not not in your archive but but mm -hmm. um, related um, because this month is the centenary of the uh, of King's College School Lodge that you mentioned um, so let us now. No. It's it's the mystery of technology, isn't it? It's, it's, Once it's, upon a time, we had the mysteries of faith. Now we have the mysteries of technology. This is this is absolutely the case. Here's um. Here's the thing. Here's the uh, a newsletter. I just wanted to point out the thing that you'd said, um, which is the uh, the archives um, used to always be very well featured in the um, in the in the Old Kings Club newsletter, and I think that's the thing um, we want to when we revive the newsletter to also um, make that happen. No. No, talk amongst yourselves. I'm having technical difficulties. I, 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 I... <laughs> Can I come in here, Richard? Alex? Yes, that's, this is it. So, 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 so Robert um, uh, Young, who is uh, the archivist of the King's College School Lodge. Yeah, a couple of points. Lucy, as you know, I'm writing up the history of King's College Lodge over the last hundred years. I will let you have a copy in, of uh, one of my drafts in due course because there may be odd snippets in there which would be of interest to you. You made reference to the King's College School railway engine. They were actually produced for some ra railway in the 1930s mm -hmm. and there were 39 of them built, yeah. all named after well-known public schools, the majority of them in, in, the, in the south of um, England. One yeah. aspect well, the idea it. was, wasn't it, that it tended to be places that the trains would actually go to. Yes, but there were but there were, were schools like rugby and so on, which of course were not on the Southern Railway um, no. network. As far as the, um, incidentally, I, one of the things I did when I retired was to go back to my childhood and have a model railways set, and I do have an engine of uh, KCS women on my uh, on my uh, layout. <laughs> Also one of my son's school's engines as well. Uh, going back to the lodge um, history for a moment, I do have some information in there on the war records of uh, certain members of the lodge, which again, you may not have that information mm. in your records. I, I don't know. Mm. Um, but uh, anyway, thank you very much for your presentation. Very, very, um, very interesting. Yeah. Um, no, it would be re be really interesting to know what you have there about the records from the war, obviously. Um, uh, but we can. Lu Lucy, it's Giles Topping. Hello. Online. And I can my, see you. <laughs> my father's, uh, my father and his three brothers were at Kings in the later thirties and my until the mid forties, and I was there with my three brothers. And one of my sons was there, but my aunt. Mm -hmm. He's still alive, aged, aging towards 89 and, and living in Wimbledon. And every time I go and see her, I get more King's memories because she was the fifth of a uh, child and four brothers who all went through King's. Ah. So if you could do an all history. In, so, yeah. in, she's she's perfect, 100% lucid still, mm -hmm. I can tell you. I saw her over the weekend. Oh, perfect. No, we're, I'm literally just at the moment trying to sign off the paperwork with our um, head of compliance, because obviously I, it's a funny thing recording an oral history. I want to try and be as clear and transparent with people as possible about the fact these are going to be kept forever in an archive and yeah. what that means. And they are really happy with that um, before they agree to doing it. But that would be amazing. Thank you. Mm. I will be in touch. Thank you. Um I feel like no, I should also interview the entire family. <laughs> the Elkingtons, well, uh, the Elkingtons uh, are many generations since the very beginning of Kings, and we have an Elkington this evening, I think. Ah. Jack runs the um, the the, um, 
the rowing do we did we did we anyway so so hunt down the the elkingtons can 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 you see the um petition for a new lodge yes did i did i, did I do, share that um i found the stuff this is stuff th these are, are papers that are lodged at um grand lodge up at um great queen street in covent garden where uh they founded with the um enthusiastic uh blessings of the um the governors a the king's college school lodge in 1921 a lot of the public schools were doing similar things uh if they hadn't already uh, the sponsoring lodge was the Grand Master's Lodge Number One, which is uh, considered rather grand, as as the name implies. A uh, load of toings and froings uh, between uh, writings of um, uh, letters of recommendation and permission and so on. Um, so, so we celebrated um, the centenary of the um, lodge, King's College School Lodge. Uh, at the beginning of this month, and um, and there are the papers. And the next thing we can see on the left is a uh, past master's uh, jewel, and on the right is a founder's jewel. We don't call them medals; they're jewels because really um, they're just uh, very um, lovely membership badges. But you can see the. Um, the coat of arms of the school, which is also the the, the, the coat of arms of, of the lodge. Here's a bit of a, a close up with a nice en enamel work from the 1920s. Uh, here's a close up of the uh, first masters on the masters uh, collar. Here's some more close ups. You can see Robert Young at the top there. Uh, you can see me at the bottom. And there we are in the Great Hall, setting up for a meeting, having a nice time. There's um, Carl Jackson, who is who was organist at the school, the director of organ. And there is the lodge uh, master's collar uh, in the middle there, uh, in the Great Hall. And the Great Hall, by the way, looks a lot nicer than most than when most of us were. Uh, at the school because the organ wasn't there in those days. There, thank you. That that, that that's that's just a nice few uh, pictures that I have to share. Alex, do you want to mention that we have a a lodge Bible? Ah, uh, yes, this is dating back to the sixteen hundred and twenties. Yes, I, I do want to mention that. Not not only this, but I also want to show it. Um. It is, uh, it is here, so um, I, I will, I will, I will, I will merely hold it up and show it. Uh, it's labelled uh, 1622 to 25, so it's an original uh, King James Bible, and it belongs to the King's College School Lodge. And uh, Robert uh, is the person who was in charge of uh, 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 having it. Um, submitted for conservation. Would you like to say something about that and Can Canterbury Cathedral? Yes, I originally showed it to the archivist at Canterbury Cathedral and what we decided in the end was rather than have it restored, we would just have some conservation work done on it, which cost us about 500 pounds. The Canterbury Cathedral said that as far as they were aware, there were only about four copies of this Bible still around in the country. And they did ask whether they could keep it for their records, but we politely uh, declined their uh, their request. <laughs> it, 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 it's a it's a lovely object, and it's in an archival box, um, and it's uh, currently here on the desk in, in this meeting. Thank God. I am. Um, Lucy, David Buckley speaking. Hello. <clears throat> uh, I wonder, I, I'm going to go back to something that in your presentation you said, <laughs> and I'm going to have to paraphrase you because my memory of exactly what you said mm -hmm. was not quite, but you mentioned something about 
uh, a new uh, requirement, more than just pure facts, was for the feeling. Now, that's where I, I'm paraphrasing you. Yes. That's not your exact word uh, of being at case, yes. Yes. Uh, I have spent considerable time in the South Pacific, mm -hmm. where most history mm -hmm. over 200 years is, in fact, anecdotal. Mm -hmm. The Maori in particular have a verbal history of life. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I am very fortunate to be uh, adopted Maori. Mm -hmm. uh, and to do so, one has to be able to recite one's whakapapa, which is one's history, <clears throat> from arrival in New Zealand through, and it must be done verbally. Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether I might be able to email you mm -hmm. some considerations for your research into the feelings which are almost uh, required to be anecdotal. Yes, that would be that would be great. That would be very helpful because, as you say, um, although we do, there is a tradition to some extent of oral history in this country. It's very recent, relatively speaking, and yeah. one that has taken quite a long time to be sort of accepted properly. I think within archival circles, because I think there's always a little bit of um, suspicion because it's so. We know memory isn't. They're never going to be factual in the way that someone could argue. Um, the, the, the term that's important. used is old wives' tales, mm. which is incredibly pejorative. Mm. Because so many old wives' tales, in fact, are of huge value. We're finding that. And in fact, in, in, in particular in Maori terms, and mm. I, I can only say this because I know, uh, the Kui, which is the female leadership mm -hmm. of Maori, which exists quite separately to uh, the Kumatua, they pass this down purely verbally. Mm -hmm. And yet, it is possible. My uh, adopted father could, up until, well, up until he died, when he met someone with a name, a Maori mm -hmm. name, he could tell the entire history of that individual because he had learnt from his own. Mm -hmm. And th there is a value. I'm not trying to suggest that we bring Maoridom into, mm -hmm. but there is a value in uh, authenticated verbal history. Yeah. And if you're looking at the feelings, and I, I do say I, I mistook your word there. I can't remember what it was, but it, it was, uh, but it was uh, a synonym of that. Mm -hmm. But if you are looking for uh, the feelings of being at Kings, mm -hmm. then you do have to accept verbal testimony rather than uh, written testimony. I completely agree, and I think that. The point is that they're also, it was a bit like before when I said, sometimes if you can have multiple sources and you bring them together, they complement one another and they help to give you a greater yes. sense of the whole picture. Um, that if you, you know, yes, obviously we all know that if you have two people's recollection of the exact same event, they may be, might be quite different, but I don't think that that belittles or undermines either of those testimonies. I think you just have to be aware when you are using them as a source, the type of source that they are. And I, I personally think that there is a huge amount of value in that, as I say, especially in organisations and organisational archives where so much of it, it strikes me of this history that, that is important at the school is about people. And too often it's almost as if they, they feel as if they're the bit that's missed out or rather pushed into something that's quite two dimensional. Indeed. And in, uh, certainly over the late 70s and early 80s, that there, there was a considerable feeling amongst the leavers at that time that they were effectively the lost generation. Mm. And the invitation for them to 
uh, input their feelings without them being regarded as merely uh, uh, anecdotal, mm. but uh, it is valuable, I would suggest. Mm. But may I email you a little more on this? Yes, please do. Um, as I, I was going to say this, that I'm, um, we'll ask, um, I'm guessing it will be Cheng as the best person um, as a sort of a post event email um, to include my contact details just so that if anyone wants to get in touch with me about anything at all if you want to visit or there's just some aspect the archive you're interested in finding out more about please do feel free to get in touch I'd be very glad mm. thank you thank you. thank you so much for your wonderful presentation um, I, I think we had a question um, from uh, Richard Morris was it Lewis. Yes, Richard Morris came in first. Yeah, th thank you, Alex. Evening, Lucy. Hello. Hello. I don't know. I don't know whether the word has got to you via um, Alex or other people on uh, OKC, but uh, I actually worked uh, briefly on Volume Two of the Register with Frank. Oh right, no, I didn't know. And um, yes, I, I I used when he he we I I, I did about maybe a couple of hours a week and he would read out the term uh, the, the, he he would indicate uh, to me the term of the of the particular year in which a boy had left the school and i would write that information down on the card the index card that he'd already got for that boy uh and i did that as i said you know, a couple of hours a week for, a, mm -hmm. for about a year um, thoroughly enjoyed it, um, and uh, so I, I was going to ask. It, presumably, you've still got the actual registers that he would have worked from, and w would you still have the index cards that I used to write on? Well, we have the index cards. We have the registers, but as I say, we only have registers that go up I think, until nineteen oh eight. So I was never entirely clear where the information. On the index cards came from whether at some point the school just switched to using index cards or whether there are some other registers that i we just do know we no longer have in the archive that are kept somewhere else so so the materials that i remember you would you would still have hmm. hopefully but um I, we can always say afterwards we can have an email it'd be great to chat to you a bit more yeah. if you don't mind yeah, um yeah. oh yes i i'd, I'd love to and uh, my 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 claim to fame, so far as the register is concerned, is that uh, I was once able to tell Frank Miles something that he didn't already know, because I I picked this up from a magazine article pre some time previously. Mm -hmm. I was able to tell him that uh, a chap called George Hayer, mm -hmm. who, who who I was obviously this this cropped up because I we happened to be working on that. Yeah. on his index card i was able to tell frank uh, that this this george Hare, who had been not not only a pupil but or, or, or obviously a pupil but later a, a master at the school uh, was the father of the novelist georgette Hare. Yeah. and and frank didn't know there you go <laughs> yeah i I'd, 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 I'd love to I'd love to talk to you um, either, either either like this or, or by email. That would be brilliant. Fantastic. Yeah. That would be great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. See that there's a raised hand from Jeffrey Jackson, if he's still there, or because I can't see a picture of him. No. Uh, um, Richard uh, Glasspool. Yes. No, we lost Richard Glasspool. No, there, are faces, there are faces here from the past. Richard Glasspool here. Hello. 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 Just, just to say thank you so much. And I recognise two or three faces. Maybe mm. others do. And suddenly you see people after 50 <laughs> or 60 years. So just to say hello to David Field, who I managed to chat to just now. But also David McKitterick, who I think worked with me in the ASP on a number of books with Robert Holloway. I may be wrong, David, but uh, if that's you, hello. We worked on Long Legged Beasties, the biggest book they ever made. I think you're muted, David. I think you're muted. 
I, I well remember printing that book. It was an enormous job. Yes. Um, and there was one hilarious moment. We were using a big um, proofing press, which must have been about five or six feet long. Yes. And of course, and we were working well after Bob Holloway had gone home. And there was a disaster one night when the big Perspex screen on it broke. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I don't know if you remember that. Yes. And of course, we, by some miracle, we managed to find a piece of the right size Perspex, drill it, get the screws back in place. And the following morning, you'd never know anything had happened about breaking the school property the night before. <laughs> Wonderful. I mean, K Kings gave us a lot of initiative in that way, I feel. We, we, we got enormous freedom. Um, I mean, we, even when we were supposed to be getting ready for A-levels and all the rest of it, um, the number of hours we put into printing was really mm. quite, quite beyond what would have been sensible if you were planning a proper curriculum. <laughs> You're right. I still have copies of most of the ASP books that we worked on in the 60s. Yeah. Oh, yes, indeed. And there's a chap who lives in London somewhere who's busy trying to write the history of it. Right. I was in touch with him um, a few months ago. But he's disappeared off the screen again. <laughs> okay. I, I, can see, I, I can see Jeffrey Jackson raising his hand. No, that's still still. Um, oh, uh, we've got Ian Ellis. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, hopefully. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Lucy. I mean, it's fantastic, I think. Uh, just very quickly, there was a mention of uh, Mike Smith, and Lucy knows I did send a picture in the other day, and if you can see it, there we are. This is it. This was the 1955 uh, cycle tour, which included going down a coal mine, hence the, uh, the helmets and so on. And uh, uh, a friend of mine, I think, was at the bottom of the screen, not on this picture, Roger Robinson was on the 1954 tour, which uh, I thought they were the first ones, but you mentioned there were two school trips even back in, in before the war, but uh, uh, hopefully I might be able to find one or two other bits and pieces that we can yeah. uh, send in. So thank you very much indeed. No, well, thank you. And thank you for the uh, for the photos as well, because it is, it's really great. I have to say, it's funny, it's obviously I've never met these people, but Mike Smith is one of the ones where I really wish that I could have met because he seems to turn up in so many different ways in the archive and it's always interesting. And one of my favourite films, because a lot of them have been digitised, is actually where they were digging a hole to, to bury radioactive material. And then, then there's this film and the music in the classrooms. And again, you just sort of think, wow, that could never happen today. <laughs> <laughs> but quite wonderful, really, uh, in a second. They were obviously all fine, um, that it could then. And as you say, but then also he's doing the film unit and photography and fencing and the cycling tours as well. And I think it's just phenomenal the way that the teaching staff, I mean, I'm sure it wasn't all of them, but a lot of them seem to be so committed to school life and were and threw themselves into it in so many different aspects. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that I just, you know, we live in an age where you, you just, I don't know, you think about people, they stay in a job for two years, maybe, um, that I think it's really commendable. I think I had a question. Uh, I, I saw Richard Armitage uh, raise his hand uh, previously. Yeah, I, I just wondered whether the school had a copy of this book. Um, we do, yes. Yeah. Tough, to tough to see, what is it? I can see it. It's Heinz, a great day school, isn't it? Yes, you've got that. Yes, yes, we do. And you've got plenty of copies of the register. Um, we do. I mean, we don't have loads, but um, but we do have some. But I always like to keep these things because quite often um, other people might get in touch with us and need it if they're doing their own research. You want, so you want more copies because I will always say yes to anything that somebody doesn't want. Um, I feel like, you know, it, it's nice that it has a home in the archive, but also it's really good because as an archivist, obviously I, I, I have this dual sort of role. On the one hand, I need to take care of everything. And on the other hand, I really want people to be able to engage with the material. So the more copies we have, the more I can be safe and knowledge that that's fine because we've got the safe copies. <coughs> and then when other people come and visit, I can get out um, sort of access copies that they can flick through and I don't have to worry at all about whether or not um, they get damaged. Does anyone have any, um, I, I've actually, uh, I promised uh, Lucy that we wouldn't keep her until midnight, you know, so uh, <laughs> at the same time, um, I'm happy to leave the, um, the um, 
uh, the chat going for if anyone wants a, a nice um, natter at the end after the end of formal proceedings. Um, and I, I'm probably going to linger for a few minutes myself if anyone's around. Um, but mainly, if, if anyone has an, any uh, pressing um, point to raise, then, then, then raise your hand vigorously now. Um, otherwise, I'm going to say really heartfelt um, thanks to Lucy and, and what a wonderful thing it is um, to have you as, um, as a speaker uh, to the Old King's Club um, and, and for us um, to have got to know you a little better. And, um, and, and looking forward as well um, to exchanging history and, 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 and um, here, here. Yes. working with you in, in the future. Well, thank you very much again for, for inviting me along. And it is very nice to actually, it's only in a virtual way, to, to feel like I'm actually starting to meet some of the members of the OKC. So it's been great. Thank you very much. Thank you. If, if we Thank were you, in person, I would I would thrust a little bottle of, of, of English um, sparkling wine into your hand. <laughs> uh, that, that'll be another time. Another time. Thank you so much. God bless. It's been amazing. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. It's John Campion here. Could you let us have your email address, please? Um, yes, my email address is just L dot inglis i n g l i s at kcs.org.uk but as i say I'm, I'm not sure when cheng who is the development secretary is working again but i'll ask her to send it through to all the people who attended tonight so that anyone can get in touch with me easily if they need to thank you thank, thank you, you lucy most most interesting evening thank you very much